Okay. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ninth annual size Global Women and Leadership Conference. This is actually um, the first in-person conference we have since the pandemic. So we are putting our efforts towards rebuilding Gual after um, not being in person for an entire year. So welcome, everybody. My name is Varda Xinhua He, a second year mayor student concentrated in international political economy, and I'm the president of Guo. So according to statistics from UN Women, an estimated 736 million women, almost one in three, have been subjected to intimate partner violence, non-partner sexual violence, or both, um, at least once in their life globally. Additionally, calls to helplines have increased fivefold in some countries, as rates of reported intimate partner violence increased because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Restricted movements, social isolation, and economic insecurity are increasing women's vulnerability to the violence in, their, in the home and around the world. As such, the increasing evidence of a shadow pandemic of gender-based violence, also known as GBV, resulting from the conditions of the COVID-19 crisis has shone a harsh light on gaps in health and GBV approaches globally, um, providing an opportunity for candid conversations with new ideas. So this year's GUAL conference will join the conversation considering what it actually means to approach GBV as a global health issue, how the situation has been in the past, and what we can do moving forward. We are honored and delighted to welcome Dr. Samira Al Tawajiri as the keynote speaker for our conference today. Dr. Al Tawajiri is the global lead on population development at the Health Nutrition and Population Global Practice of the World Bank. She is a board certified OBGYN with over 10 years of experience in clinical practice. She has a master's degree in public health from Harvard and a PhD in health policy and postdoctoral fellowship from Johns Hopkins. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Al Tawajiri to the stage. Good morning. What an honor and a privilege to be here this morning and um, answer to the invitation from the, uh, the um, Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies and this group. And thanks for the opportunity to make me um, walk one more time down memory lane when it comes to Johns Hopkins. I've spent very nice years doing my postdoctoral fellowship. Let me just start by some context when it comes to gender-based violence. Um, it's, it's a vast subject, and um, I don't think anyone would do it any justice by trying to package it in any way, shape, or form. However, um, some, as I said, some, some context may actually help this discussion. So gender-based violence primarily happens as a cause and a consequence of gender inequalities and inequities. It includes a range of violent acts, mainly committed by males against females, although by definition, gender-based violence encompasses both uh, violence against men and, and, and women, boys and girls. GBV also includes, but it's not limited to domestic violence, um, which is um, by an intra-family member and intimate partner violence, including physical, sexual, or psychological harm by a current or a former partner or spouse. Sexual violence alone, which is, uh, include, include rape, sexual abuse, forced pregnancies, and prostitution. Traditional harmful practices, which also include female genital mutilation, honor killings, and dowry-related violence, and finally, human trafficking. Now, this is not to say that depriving young girls from schooling and marrying them early is not gender-based violence. This is not to say that girls in rural areas are employed in farms without really being paid and deprived from the, from the, uh, from the um, opportunity to accumulate human capital and also go to school. And, and, and the list goes on and on. I have focused on these forms of violence because this is where the touch with the health system comes to light much more than any, anywhere else. So um, for this, as I said, I will focus on uh, domestic violence, um, intimate partner violence, and sexual violence. 
against females and their reproductive years. So that's the context I am going to be talking about. This will also include into insights um, of the magnitude of the problem, the risk factors, health effects, as well as cost to society and impact on the economic growth. Let's look at some statistics to begin with. The prevalence of violence against women and girls globally, and this was alluded to in the introduction, there is an estimated 736 million women, almost one in three, have been subjected to physical and or sexual intimate violence, partner violence, non-partner violence, or both, at least once in their lives. So um, in, a, in, a, in a room like this, uh, if you're sitting in rows of three, it's either you or the person on your right or the person on your left that actually is a statistic. And that's scary, to say the least. Most violence against women is perpetrated by a current or a former husband or intimate partners, those people that we know and we interact with. Of those who have been in a relationship, almost one in four adolescent girls aging 15 to 19 24% have experienced physical and or sexual violence from an intimate partner or a husband. 16% of young women aged 15 to 24 experienced this violence in the past 12 months at any point in their lives. So it's, it's ongoing and it's active. In 2018, and, it's, and, and this is according to you in women, an estimated one in seven women have experienced physical and or sexual violence from an intimate partner or husband in the past 12 months, and that's, that's narrowing it to the age, ages of 15 to 49. Globally also, violence against women disproportionately affects low and lower middle income countries, although it actually cuts through everything, every single indicator we have, including the social um, status, the economic status, and the education status. 37% of women aged 15 to 49 living in countries classified by the Sustainable Development Goals as least developed have been subject to physical and or sexual intimate partner violence in their life. 22% of women living in the least developing countries have been also exposed to such uh, aggressivity. Globally, 81,000 women and girls were killed in 2020 alone. Around 47,000 of those 81, around 48% or more than two thirds died at the hands of an intimate partner or a family member, which equals to a woman or a girl being killed every 11 minutes in their homes. So by the time we finish this seminar, there would be more than 15 women who were killed in their homes, in their familiar environments. And 58% of all the killings perpetrated by, by intimate partners or other family members, the victim was either a woman or a girl below age. And it is a major public health problem for many, many reasons. Um, there is a huge body of evidence in the literature on, the, uh, on documenting the often severe and long-lasting impact of GBV on human health, including but not limited to fatal outcomes. We just talked about be, w women and girls being killed, acute and chronic physical injuries and disabilities, serious mental health problems, and behavioral deviations, increasing the risk of subsequent victimization, including depression and other, uh, other mental health issues. And then finally, again, ecological disorders, unwanted pregnancies, obstetric complication, and HIV AIDS. GBV also has devastating consequences, not only for the person who experiencing it, but also for those who are witnessing it within the household, and in particular on children. Victims of GBV often have severe feelings of guilt and are stigmatized and blamed by family, friends, and society. This often compounds the damaging consequences of GBV, undermining the dignity, autonomy, and security of the victims. And just a word on the economic impact of gender-based violence, and this is something that, that I borrow from my vast experience as somebody who'd been working on sexual and reproductive health and rights. We, went, we in the reproductive health community went around um, for decades saying, you know, women should not die in child labor. Um, pregnancy is not a sickness. This is what happens to a family when the mother passes away. We really found very little in terms of the response and, and the response here being more fiscal space, more, um, uh, more resources being availed to uh, programs that actually cut across maternal mortality and morbidity until 
someone smart out there started calculating the economic burden of maternal mortality. And this is when we actually captured at least the ears and attention of the ministers of finance. And, and in my world at the World Bank, it was our, our, our usual clientele. So I've been really fond of the economic burden of disease rather than the disability adjusted life years and the human rights uh, document, which stands, still stands, I'm not negating it, but I think a little bit of a flavor of the economic burden usually carries, carries us uh, a lot. So in, in short, um, the economic costs of loss of productivity out of GBV, uh, GBV and domestic violence conservatively ranges from around 1.2 to 2% of the GDP, which is a lot of money. About most governments spending on education in developing countries, just to put it in a context. So what can the health sector do? What can we physicians and public health physicians actually do to at least mitigate the effects and the impact? Although, although I am a solid believer that we should actually employ something called the EVAO, eliminating violence against women and girls, but not, not, not dealing with the, with the consequences. But I think this is, uh, this is a discussion for another day. There is, there is a recognized phenomena of the health sector being really quite inept in dealing with gender-based violence. And this is not because most healthcare providers, only because most healthcare providers fail to diagnose and register GBV, uh, not only due to socio-cultural and traditional barriers, lack of time, lack of resources, inadequate physical facilities, but even more so due to the lack of awareness, knowledge, and poor clinical practices with limited direct communication and failure to do a full physical examination most of the time, not to mention register and monitor the effectiveness of the quality of care. Further, the fear of violence and stigma reduces many victims' willingness to use health services. The large majority turns to informal networks of friends and community members for help. I would also throw in the mix something called the provider's bias. We are all um, products of our own social backgrounds and our own communities. And if the healthcare provider sitting in a dispensary or in a clinic believes in gender-based violence, then it would be very difficult for that person to actually recognize um, early signs of gender-based violence, especially domestic violence. And we often see these women coming to these healthcare facilities with no apparent reason. And um, that makes obstetricians and gynecologists on the front line, but also the pediatricians, because if she cannot find an excuse to bring herself to the clinic, then she brings her kids. And this is when I think that early detection brings in a huge amount of value add without really digging deeper into the personal issues of these, of these uh, people. The health sector can actually and should minimize the prevalence and impact uh, of GBV through an improvement to the primary prevention, like it shouldn't happen to begin with, by promoting community awareness and preventing incidences of GBV, or the secondary prevention, early identification, confidentiality, monitoring, and respectful treatment of survivors addressing physical, mental, and reproductive health care needs, tertiary prevention, which means more long-term counseling, mental health care, and rehabilitation, and finally, referral, because this is always a multi-sectoral response. I mean, you can look at a woman who had been raped or a girl who had been raped and provide all the health care that you can. But then there, there are many things that this woman need when she actually walks out of that clinic. And, you know, this includes economic, social, uh, shelter, legal, if she, if she decides to, to press charges. I personally, as a, as an, as a former practicing physician, uh, believe that improving the patient-provider interaction is the most feasible, affordable, and efficient intervention within any healthcare system aiming to address the survivors of GBV effectively. And we have to also ground this to, level, uh, to the level of not only the country, but also subnationally, because the infrastructure plays a pivotal role into all of this. So many countries, in my experience at least, are building capacity to prevent and manage GBV. And while the effectiveness of the various approaches still needs to be evaluated, there is no doubt that violence is preventable. We can prevent this phenomenon from happening all over again. And on national plans, interventions that most likely to be effective in reducing health inequalities 
and in relation to GBV include change in fiscal policies, and I refer to the notion of the economic burden, the promotion of gender equality, because I think the whole thing is really anchored around women agency and women ability to own their own bodies and, and, and make choices for themselves and for their families. And also structural changes to the relative position of women and men in society, because we've come across many surveys where stabbing a girl on the face is actually normal in, 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 in some societies. And we're not going to name those societies, of course. So um, addressing GBV calls of a systemic health sector approach and actually multi-sectoral approach as well. At the national, regional, and municipal health policies, strategies, plans, and budgets, and legislations, this all needs to fall into space. Improving the quality of care for survi survivors of GBV and others. And others, we, we, we just talked about how family is actually impacted, not just the, the um, survivor herself. Information, education, and communication. Of course, that this is not acceptable. It's against human rights. It's against anyone's rights. And then the better data collection, research, and knowledge uh, sharing on GBV. And we know that um, data is very scarce when it comes to GBV. Uh, there are a lot of underreporting that goes on and misreporting because, you know, she fell down the stairs while she's actually being pushed down the stairs and, 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 the, and, the, and the saga continues. And finally, strengthen the intersectoral collaboration, uh, networking with partners, partnership with other ministries, civil society, non-governmental organization, uh, organizations, and the private sector to enhance awareness, prevent, monitor, and manage GBV. And effective community and society interventions are based on coordination between the legal, social, health, and education system and the workplace. I did say at the beginning that I am going to be focusing on domestic violence and inter-partners um, uh, violence, uh, but I think no discussion on gender-based violence is ever complete without really shining a light on two things. The first one is the gender dimensions of pandemics, and we're still living one. Um, two years ago, we, we, we talked about gender inequality and gender equality as it pertains to the health system by talking about availing universal health coverage, by improving access, by improving demand and supply and all the economic um, uh, 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 problems and issues that actually come in between them. But like the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic had actually exposed the inefficiencies in our health systems, it also unmasked. The, um, the severe disparities that we see between genders. And I actually, one of those people that I refuse to, to call it the shadow pandemic, it's actually the original pandemic because the virus may go away, but these inequalities will, 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 will need decades of, of work to, um, to be eliminated. Pandemic, uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic demands concerted effort to quickly safeguard the world's population. But when the complex web, web of response operations is mounted, the critical consideration of gender is often overlooked. It's a grave oversight since gender plays a key role in determining who gets fast access to critical health care services, and because women are also assigned care providers roles that increase their risk of exposure to the disease as well as their chances of actually spreading it because they are the caregivers. Based on the most recent information, the most at-risk group for COVID-19 is the elderly, especially people who are above 80 years old. And women, as we know, live longer, what I call the feminization of aging. And um, they, they by, by, by statistics, they make um, a significant part of this group across the globe, which makes them more vulnerable because they also tend to be financially and otherwise dependent on family members or other caregivers. Maternal and child mortality will increase because of the disruption in the health services. We have seen the phenomena of repurposing most of these healthcare facilities to actually serve the pandemic, um, foregoing a lot of these essential services. And I just would like to, I mean, there had been a lot that's written about this, but I just want to refer to one um, analysis that was done by The Lancet at the beginning of the pandemic and sometime in, in the middle of 2020. It found that reduction in coverage of around 15%, only 15% for six months, would result in about 253,000 additional child deaths and around 12,000 additional maternal deaths, while a reduction of around 45% for six months would result in about 1.1 million 
additional child deaths and about 56,000 additional maternal deaths. Those numbers are staggering. I mean, we've worked three, four, five decades to actually reduce under five mortality and maternal mortality, only to flip back to where we were probably in 1970 or 1960 in, in the span of six months. And, and, and that's, if that's not scary, I don't know what else is. So that would represent about between 9.8% and 44% increase in under five mortality and between eight and 38% increase in maternal death. And this had, this analysis had taken place over 118 low and middle income countries. So it wasn't a one off. It was actually across the board and it was a global phenomenon. And we also know that during a pandemic, many women avoid seeking essential health services because it's, it's the pandemic and their exposure of sexual exploitation and violence during the public health crisis actually become much more. Because aside from disruptions, it cannot be forgotten that the public health crisis can increase vulnerabilities. The, the rule of law becomes fragile in a pandemic, exposing vulnerable women and girls to gender-based violence. Globally, again, over one-third of women report having experienced some form of physical or sexual violence. In a pandemic, they may be forced into exchanging sexual favors for testing, treatment, vaccines, or even other basic supplies. Being quarantined in, and or isolated with an abusive partner um, or the stress of living under these conditions may also increase the risk of violence against women. This only leads us to a very logical conclusion, which is pandemic responses must address gender gaps. There is absolutely everything to gain and nothing to lose by actually looking at the many lessons that have been learned from the pandemic about the gender gaps in human endowment, economic opportunity, voice and agency that have been exacerbated. But the one thing that stands out in the effort to close the gender gap is the need, again, for a multi-sectoral response that engages the individual and community. My last point, and this is another issue that I said I will not talk about, and I probably cannot leave this podium without talking about it, is sexual violence as a weapon of war. And we've all been horrified in the past few weeks of the images coming from the Ukraine. But this is not a one-off. We've been seeing this for many, many, many years. The sexual violence that's committed across entire communities spread diseases, destroy families, and family ties, and inflicts harm over generations, not just one generation. Sexual violence as a tactic of war reinforces gender inequalities and normalizes sexual violence, even after a conflict has long ended. There are no precise figures on war rape. I challenge anyone to give me something that is actually systematically put together in terms of the volume of the problem. Some statistics can be provided, but the proportion of this phenomena is so immense and it's so big that it remains to be put into perspective. Real work remains to be done to identify the exact extent of war rape in the world. Think of this. There were 80,000 cases in China in 1937. 200,000 cases in Bangladesh in 1971, 100,000 in Guatemala and 500,000 in Rwanda in 1994, 60,000 in Sierra Leone and Bosnia and Herzegovina, between three and 5,000 in Kenya and Zimbabwe in 2000 during elections, 10,000 in Guinea and between 200 and 600,000 in DRC and Sudan. Equally frightening, Figures in Libya, Syria, and Central African Republic, Sri Lanka, and also in Nigeria with Boko Haram. In Iraq, it's estimated today that more than 7,000 Yazidi women are sexual slaves of Daesh, 3,000 of whom are still prisoners. They haven't been liberated. These figures are those documented and must be multiplied by three or four times to correspond to reality. In Burma, for example, rape used as a weapon of ethnic cleansing, not just war, against the Rohingya refugees. And the, the figure is around 50,000 people. So no figures to, to date can be considered reliable as no comprehensive study has yet been conducted, despite the scale of the phenomena and despite the fact that international criminal institutions, such as the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, 
And more recently, the International Criminal Court have established that rape is a, is, a, uh, is a constituent element of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Yet, too few trials are being conducted as we speak. The main reasons, difficulty of gathering uh, evidence, testimonials from victims, evidence of orders given directly at a higher level, but also and above all, the lack of pragmatic and effective response. There are 10 Security Council resolutions criminalizing sexual violence and rape against women and men during a conflict. But as Dr. Dennis McWaggy, the Nobel Prize laureate for his work on the subject puts it, everyone applauded, but nothing happened. I would add that we should stop treating women bodies as an ideological battlefield, because it's not, it's not and it shouldn't. Now, if I were to leave this podium with one single message for all of us this morning, is that it's very simple. If the conditions are right, are not right, then rights should not be conditioned. Thank you. If it's on, okay, there we go. Um, we're just gonna open up the floor to questions now. Um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Altuashri, see one in the back, I'll walk over to you. If you could just introduce yourself and then ask your question. Yeah. Hi, uh, um, my name is Mark Greenholch. I am a, I have my PhD in rehab sciences and I also have an MPH in epidemiology. Um, a lot of the work that I've done, and like a lot of my passions, di indirectly focus a lot on women's health. Um, and it's amazing what you were saying earlier that about like how the pandemic re like revealed all of these um, in inequities between, inequality between men and women. And you talked about like the health, like you talked about healthcare workforce. And to me that was very like, that was, you know, you were preaching to the choir there with me because a lot of the things I did my dissertation on, which I defended right before the pandemic, became mainstream during the pandemic. The health, like, you know, women becoming overwhelmed by, uh, because they're in, like, women-dominated fields within clinical professions, uh, becoming overwhelmed by the various factors related to the pandemic. But one of the things I wanted to touch on, too, was how I also do a lot of work with people with disabilities. Um, how, what do you see... Um, how much do you see disability as a confounding factor in um, interpersonal violence and women's violence uh, across the globe? Shall we take a couple more, or shall I respond on one-to-one -one basis? Um, I'll leave that up to you. What's your question? Let me take this on. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I'm, most of my work is on the social determinants of health. And I, uh, my nine to five job is the demographic transition and dividend and how do we build a human capital and what have you. Uh, my evening job is to look at the social determinants of health, especially when it comes to health outcomes, including gender disability, um, you know, remoteness, poverty, and all of these things. And I think that um, historically we have had a lot to deal with when it comes to uh, violence and especially sexual violence against women who are in institutions, uh, whether it is a physical disability or it is a mental disability and what have you. And, and the, the literature is, is full of really horrifying stories about being all of this. I think disability is also something that needs to be tackled through a multi-sectoral approach. And uh, it's not just about you know, providing a ramp for a wheelchair person to actually come into the health facility or um, providing, you know, assistance in a, in a shower for somebody who is, you know, cannot move. I think we are so focused on the physical disability that we often overlook the other disabilities like, you know, the, the ability to read something, for example, or visually impaired, um, impaired people. So I think, and, and the pandemic unmasks all of this. There is no question about that. Um, and I'd also put the burden of caring for disabled people, disabled persons within a household, again, squarely on the shoulders of women. So one of the things probably we need to do is, is again, reviving that multi-sectoral approach, looking, you know, at transportation, looking at uh, health, looking at home health, looking at, uh, you know, issues that makes the, 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 the daily life of these, these disabled persons um, much more um, easier to deal with than if they were actually on their own. Thank you. Of course. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Go. Hello. Thank you for your talk today. My name is Stephanie. I'm a student here at Johns Hopkins focusing on um, energy environment policy. And I was curious, so you said that what I took away is that the root of the gender-based violence tends to be based in gender inequalities. And so I was curious if in the research is most of you know, the literature and research conducted in stats specifically for heterosexual relationships and how do same-sex couples or violence within those couples or violence towards you know, queer people based on their sexual orientation factor into the gender-based violence uh, research? Sure. I mean, we have an emerging evidence talking about almost the same statistics in same gender relationships, but the, and a lot needs to be done, um, simply also because the data is not forthcoming. Yeah? I mean, in many parts of the world, uh, same-sex relationships are not only not welcome, they, they could be criminalized, uh, and I can name a few countries. Uh, however, I think... Um, it is gender inequality, there is no question about it, because it's also a show of power over, you know, rape during war, for example, is not about, you know, sex in itself. It's about demoralizing an entire community. So is the other forms of violence against women and girls, specifically because it's establishing boundaries, it's establishing power. And I would think also that there is a lot of, of, of human nature into the into the doctrine of violence, if there is, is if there is such one, and that again is establishing boundaries and 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 uh, and overpowering someone. And as I said, we don't have a lot done on on same same sex relations, but what the evidence that's emerging is actually talking about almost the same trend, the same you know phenomena, the same uh, pathways. Sorry, the same pathways and the same indicators. However. I think most of the virus against the LGBT community comes from, from the environment rather than from the interrelationships. Because as I said, many parts of the world does not even recognize that this is something that could actually happen uh, you know, at, at, at our watch or in our lifetime um, because of things that actually are outside the, um, the span of this discussion. Okay. Megan, did you have a question? Yeah. Good morning, and thank you so much for coming to share with us. I really enjoyed your talk. My name is Megan Rogers, and I'm a first year student here at SICE focused on conflict management, um, local level peace building, and things of the sort. And I'm really interested, recently I've heard a lot of rhetoric, specifically in Ukraine, but in other areas as well, about the um, ability to document crimes, uh, war crimes, and in this case, sexual violence um, as an act of war, um, should be helping us to to bring about justice and accountability um, in a post-war situation. Um, and I've heard a lot of optimism about that in Ukraine, um, that of course the goal is prevention, but once these acts um, do happen, about being able to hold perpetrators accountable because of new mechanisms, new technology that allows us to document things better. Um, however, I feel like this technology, this ability to document has been around for a while. It was here in Rwanda, the world watched, they saw what was going on. And um, so how can we better use our ability to document to actually bring about justice for victims in these war situations? Um, an excellent question. That's probably more than a million dollar one. But um, let me just also start by saying it's the same technology that we have within our reach these days that also tells you the fact and it's opposite. So you don't know at the end what do you believe. You know, all the um, atrocities that we're allegedly committed by the Russian army in, in the Ukraine, were denied by the Russians as staged. And I am not saying that it's staged or not saying it's not staged, you know, because the, 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 the amount of social media that, that really sort of invades our bedrooms first thing in the morning is, is very difficult to, 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 to isolate. However, I think that we need to be, um, as an international community, when I say we, I think we need to be much more diligent into not only trying to document cases, but also offering incentives for the survivors to actually come forward. And the incentive cannot be money. It, it has to be, you know, shelter and protection and a promise for justice. And this, I, I, I see it a lot, probably after the war had subsided or at least became lighter, when we start talking about national dialogue and civil dialogue, because 
rape is a huge insult to one's dignity and and you know a lot a lot of times it happens because it's not the women that's being raped although the, most of the of the harm falls around the shoulders of these women but also to demoralize men and also men and boys get raped during war so i think when 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 this comes up, comes out there is a lot of incentive for this woman to say you know we need to document this because this is going to be protecting your next generation your daughter or your niece or that's one thing the other thing i think we also feel uh, when, when it's war you know we, we get very busy looking at um more or less refugee camps and we distribute tents and blankets and food and we're really quite oblivious to the fact that these people need protection more than anything else and we've seen rape also being conducted by the very people who are guarding those i mean we've seen it in 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 south sudan we've seen it in in rwanda so i think we also need to be very very mindful of protecting these people and i think the more, the ones that come forward are worthy of more protection simply because they're help and masking the entire phenomena it's a very pumpy journey and i think we did well somewhere we didn't do as well in another time but also remember that rape is very personal it's 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 a violation of everything that we cherish as as individuals whether we are men or women so it takes a lot to actually have somebody open up about you know being raped and some and we've seen women being raped and mutilated in some parts of the world and killed so how do you go back and report on something like this so it i'm not saying it cannot be done i think it can be done but at the same time we need to be very diligent and really sort of you know look look over our shoulders every step of the way because things may change while we're marching forward thank you any other questions is that one from you okay Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us this morning. Um, it was so amazing to hear all of your experience. I really loved what you were saying about the role of physicians and how that can be kind of a tool that we can use moving forward to kind of see some of these trends and, and prevent that. And I just was wondering if you could share maybe anything that you know of that's been done or what that might look like for programming for physicians to, you know, learn about that kind of sensitive training to prevent any of that. I think that that's definitely a... a key um, piece moving forward to kind of solving this big issue that we have. And so I'd just love to hear any thoughts you have about what that might look like. Sure. And, th and that's a subject very close to my heart because I'm leading on a, on a, a multi-country project in the Sahel uh, in Africa. Uh, it's called the uh, Sahel Women Empowerment and the Dem Demographic Dividend Project. And within that, I mean, the design of the project is really very, very simple. We increase demand, we increase supply, and then we build around it government institutions. It started in six countries and now we are at about 11 countries. It's also a regional program. So one of the things we've recognized earlier on is that A, most of the health, health um, force uh, as physicians is actually men. So, uh, and, and that was, it wasn't, it wasn't a da discovery, you know, <laughs> we always knew that. And the second thing is that um, men in general, we'd had a lot of focus groups because, before we designed the program. Uh, they're very um, conscious. If they become self-conscious when they are interacting with a woman that they suspect that may have been aggressed. And we're talking here about, you know, uh, intimate partner violence and domestic violence. We are not branching out to, you know, rape and all of these things. And, and, and oftentimes also they don't have an entry point, although this woman may have been at that clinic daily for a week because she's not sick. She just wants to talk about what's been happening to her. So we had a, a training program that looks at recognizing the early signs and symptoms of domestic violence, which is really starts by looking at the chart. You know, so this so it, it, you may not be the same physician. So you say this woman had been here the day before yesterday, and you know, symptoms were vague. She was prescribed analgesics, and she was sent home. Now she's here again today with another set of complaints, simply again because this woman is not ill. So I think that's the first sign. The second sign is try and talk to this woman. You know, and this is where the training actually was was most impactful and most effective because 
We've discovered earlier on that these, these physicians are completely socially inept when it comes to talking to a stranger, you know, uh, and especially about personal things. And we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa. We're not talking about, you know, um, Boston or Los Angeles or Maryland. or So uh, it, it, the, the cultural aspects, the cultural, you know, background really makes a lot of difference. Another thing we did is that we... We, ta we tackled and we targeted men and boys as partners into the reproductive health journey. You know, we talk about sexual health, we talk about sexual rights, and this is really unheard of in, in, in a context like Sub-Saharan Africa. We created something we, we call the husband's schools. You know, so we really lead all of these young men into somewhere where don't, we don't sit them down and teach them, we just have, you know, this conversation. We did the same for adolescent girls, you know, we called it uh, girls clubs, where they, you know, they learn about uh, agency and, you know, um, empowerment, but not necessarily um, economic empowerment, although I think it's, it's, the, it's the queen of empowerment when it comes to, to, to empowering women and girls. And, and it's been incremental. So we just had a mid-year evaluation about 18 months ago, and it turns out that these social interventions are actually the most paying off because we've seen a very, um, you know, a, a very positive feedback within the community. Recently, we've embarked into identifying local heroes, local champions, people who are influential in their society. And, and among those were the religious leaders, for example, because, you know, oftentimes the doc when it comes to the document being, you know, about religion, there is very little you can say, especially in a religious community. So what we did is that we took this, this, this bunch of religious people and actually converted them into our agents of change rather than us as the World Bank coming in and you know, doing all of this. Of course, there's always the conspiracy, the conspiracy theory or, or three or four of them. But when we use local people that are trusted by the communities, the, the message did not only, only carry much further it actually became grounded into into the into the the thinking of that community so that's that's some of the things i can think of in this hastiness yeah thank you so much of course thanks i think we have time for one more there you go. okay thank you for sharing this uh, sharing with us this this morning and um, i have a follow-up question regarding to that because i feel like most of the time um the financial aid that we got from international organizations or like other private sector or public sector is more like in an emergency solving way like uh, in Syria or in Afghanistan we could see like they are providing shelters providing sanitation waters and like to save the emergency those recovering from war or conflict um, I'm just curious about if there's any more um, examples or more you think more sustainable solving way on financial aid towards like probably not those from conflict solving aspect, but for a long-term, um, like, sewing ways? I, I'm not sure if I'm making it clear. Yeah, sure. No, no, I get Thank it. You. I get it. Um, I, uh, I'll tell you a story, a short one, I promise. How much time do we have? Uh, okay, so that, that's enough for my story. Uh, I, um, I am, I am um, a many generations Arab woman. Uh, you know, I've, I've been an Arab, I think, for as long as there were Arabs. And um, I came from a background whereby, you know, we really sort of, my generation was demoralized by the lack of democracy and the lack of institutions and the lack of, this mic does not like me. <laughs> so uh, we, we, be, we became very quickly demoralized and, I, and I've been here in the United States for some 25 years. I came as a student and then, I continued on and I met my husband and then we had a child and then became the international organization. So I was really sort of, you know, a, a, a true diaspora more than anything else. And then um, this, the Arab Spring happened, or what's called the Arab Spring. And I, um, I missed Tunis completely because it was short-lived and I was in Africa doing one of those aid memoirs things. The, the second one was Egypt and I took it very, very personal. It was really personal to me. I would actually um, have the TV on in my office and the TV on in my bedroom and I would watch 24 hours all of these very dramatic events. Long story short, UN Women want, was recruiting um, a, a regional director for Arab states at that time. And uh, this is gender equality and the empowerment of women, as you know, it's, it's this the newest um, 
UN organization, and I, I couldn't watch the Arab Spring on TV, so I applied and I fought for it and I got it. So I land in Cairo at the peak of the so-called Arab Spring, and uh, among that, there were the Syrian refugees crisis, you know, the Palestinian refugee crisis is, is 45, 50 years old. And I'm saying all of this just to bring you to the fact that when I first navigated the Za'atari camp, which is a huge camp on the outskirts of Amman, Jordan, that's host at that time to about 700,000 Syrian refugees, the UNHCR person looked at me and said, what are you doing here? Because, you know, we, uh, they, they, they erect tents, they, they provide blankets and food, and that's that, you know. And then they work with WHO and other donor agencies to provide probably health care. And we were really adamant on changing that narrative because what we wanted to do is, of course, not, not, not probably encourage this woman for political participation the minute we walk into a refugee camp because there are basic needs. We recognize that. But also the, 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 the camp was a textbook example of a population that's homogenous and it's fleeing the same danger. So it's, it's, it's not difficult to actually build some capacity around economic empowerment, around education, around voice and agency, around you know, all of other aspects that leads to the, 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 the political participation. Fast forward to about three years later, we had the first women delegation that was actually part of the peace negotiations that I personally took to Geneva at the first, at the beginning of the, of the peace negotiations. So all what I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of potential. There is a lot of um, opportunities to actually look at the nexus between humanitarian assistance and development. We just need to be much more cognizant of the, both these possibilities. We need to be possibilists ourselves. And at the same time, we need to actually be opportunistic and look for, for you know, entry points that are otherwise untapped. And I, I am sure that this, this did not become the norm. I'm sure that if you walk into another refugee camp run by UNHCR, with all respect to my colleagues there, the first priority is going to be water, sanitation, tents, and, and I'm not denying that. All what I'm trying to say is that past the first few days, now what? Now, what do we do? Of course, yeah, health care is important. So we ended up actually creating something we call the Oasis for the women and girls in that, um, in that uh, camp with UNFPA that talks about you know, early marriage, contraception, family planning, and also talks about literacy, talks about language skills. And I, the last time I checked, it's still going and it's still being um, donor funded. So this is something that, as I said, we need to be much more cognizant of the possibilities rather than just, you know, follow the, the, the regular uh, narrative. We just need to be bold more than anything else. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think if anyone has any last pressing questions, we maybe have time for one more before we close. Okay. All right. Well, then, thank you so much. Dr. Thank you. I'm going to hand the mic off. Yeah, thank you so much, Al Tawajiri, for your wonderful talk. Um, Dr. Wang Kaur teaches with the um, African Studies Program um, at SAIS, and she also directs the SAIS Women Lead um, Program. Her primary areas of specialization are comparative politics with a focus on African politics and women and genders. Studies. Within women's gender studies, her research and teaching interests include women's political participation with an emphasis on ministerial level politics in Africa, women's health and health policy, feminist international relations, and the political economy of gender in Africa. I will now be handling off to Dr. Wang Kuo, who introduced our wonderful panelists. Thank you, Verda. Um, thank you for the wonderful work you're doing, you and your team. Uh, good morning. And uh, it's lovely to have you with us today. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, it's great to know that the work is continuing, right, despite all odds. Um, and so we are talking about gender-based violence. It is frustrating that we continue to talk about this issue at the level we, um, we're doing in this age and time. But go figure, right? Um, as we know, it is 
a human rights violation. Um, while we know that some men are survivors, we also know that uh, women are predominantly uh, impacted by this. Um, one out of every three women um, will experience gender-based violence in her lifetime. As horrifying as this statistic is, we know that it's become even more horrifying um, given the events of the past three years as um, the pandemic um, you know, had far-reaching far uh, implications for uh, women and girls, <clears throat> um, but also for families and, and communities. Um, caring and uh, preventing and eradicating gender-based violence is just as intractable, if not more intractable, um, in, in recent times. And um, over the decades, um, you know, several frameworks and models that have been applied uh, to, towards uh, caring for, um, preventing, and eradicating the scourge, um, that's what I like to call it, uh, seem not to have produced the desired effect. Hence, um, the shift to a health systems approach. Uh, with me to discuss this today is an amazing set of women. Um, and I will introduce first, uh, to my left, uh, a dear friend. Um, we're, we're glad you're back with us, Mary. Uh, Dr. Ellsberg is, Mary Ellsberg is the executive director and founding director of the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University. Dr. Ellsberg has more than 30 years of experience in international research and programs on gender and development. Before joining the university in August 2012, Dr. Ellsberg served as Vice President for Research and Programs at the International Center for Research on Women. On women. Dr. Ellsberg's deep connection to global gender issues stems not only from her academic work, but also from living in Nicaragua for nearly 20 years, leading public health and women's rights advocacy. She was a member of the core research team of the World Health Organization's multi-country study on domestic violence and women's health. And she authored more than 40 books and articles on violence against women and girls. Dr. Ellsberg earned a doctorate in epidemiology and public health from Ume University in Sweden and a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies from Yale University. Thank you once again. And um, directly to her left is um, Professor uh, Nancy Glass. Um, Professor Nancy Glass conducts clinical and community-based intervention research with diverse populations across multiple settings, domestically and globally. Since 2002, Dr. Glass has served as principal investigator of nine federally funded multidisciplinary research projects to improve safety, health, and economic security and address gender inequality in diverse community and clinic settings. Dr. Glass has also collaborated with global experts and donors to implement and evaluate innovative primary prevention programs that challenge social norms that sustain violence against women in humanitarian settings. She has also helped examine the pre prevalence of gender-based violence in the three regions of Somalia to inform GBV programs and services. Dr. Glass works to improve healthcare systems response through a partnership that examines the feasibility and acceptability of assist GBV to identify survivors of GBV in health settings with displaced and refugee populations in Kenya after developing the screening tool in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Colombia, among other amazing work uh, Dr. Glass does. Welcome, glad to have you with us. And um, directly to our left is um, My Myra. Uh, Myra Burton has worked at the intersection of gender inequity gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health for the past 20 years, spanning 20 countries across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Originally from the Philippines, Ms. Bertrand 
Bertrand has a passion for helping the most marginalized. As the director for gender at GPEGO, she is leading the integration of strategies that promote gender equity in GPEGO's programs worldwide, including global programs on maternal health, family planning, and HIV prevention. In doing so, she works to ensure technical excellence by always bridging research with practice. She has a faculty associate appointment at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she lectures on gender and health systems. Ms. Bertrand is also a graduate of Johns Hopkins Science with an MA in International Development and Latin American Studies. Again, thank you. Um, as you can see, we have warrior women with us today. And so this is about to get interesting. We're peace loving. <laughs> Except, you know, when folks start messing with other women. <laughs> um, and so, um, I'm just going to start with you, Mary. Uh, please share a bit about your background and how you came to work on gender-based violence and global health. Thank you very much. Am I on? Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my background in gender-based violence started sort of by accident, and now it's about 30 years ago. I was living in Nicaragua. I was interested in starting um, my doctorate in epidemiology, and I was part of a, a group of, of Swedish and Nicaraguan researchers who were doing maternal and child health. But at the same time, I've always been very active in the women's movement, and I was in Nicaragua and um, started thinking as we were th talking about these issues that they were studying, child survival, um, uh, teenage pregnancy, high maternal mortality, different problems that were, that were sort of at the top of the, of the public health agenda. I sort of just by accident sort of said, well, you know, have you ever thought about looking at violence and how that might impact it? Think about women being beaten during pregnancy and could that affect maternal mortality or what about, you know, incest or sexual assault causing, um, you know, uh, adolescent pregnancy, et, et cetera. And every, they all looked at each other and were like, oh, you know, we never even thought of that. If and, and they offered me a chance to do my studies. That's how I ended up studying in Sweden. They offered me a chance to study there and to make that my subject. And so I was part of this team. And what I did for my research was um, the first prevalence study. So this is early 90s. The first prevalence study in Latin America on intimate partner violence and sexual assault I did in, the sec in um, a city in Nicaragua where we found out that one out of every two women, so 50, almost 55% of women, had experienced physical or sexual violence by a partner. And at the time, it was something that nobody talked about. So that was actually astonishing, even to us. And then with my partners, we started, and, and it actually served as the basis of, an, of the very first uh, domestic violence law in Nicaragua, and one of the first in Latin America, because we were able to prove with hard numbers how common it was. And then with my other colleagues, we did studies on um, low birth weight, on maternal mortality, on adolescent pregnancy, as I said, child survival. We did a population-based case control study. And in each one of those, we would ask questions as about um, had she suffered domestic violence? Had the woman in the year before her child died suffered domestic violence? Had she suffered it during pregnancy? Um, all of, you know, all these different moments. And we found just in this whole body of research that domestic violence and child sexual abuse was one of the most important risk factors for low birth weight above drinking and smoking in the case of Nicaragua. It was the most important factor for adolescent pregnancy, whereas people have been talking about education and lack of education being the main issue. Well, why were girls dropping out of, out of high school? They were dropping out because they, they were being abused or they were already pregnant. And... Um, and the same for child mortality, which nobody had even thought, like my professors who are pediatricians and epidemiologists were totally shocked. It had never occurred to them that this was the case. And we found out that women who had been sexually or physically abused by a partner had six times the rate of under five mortality 
as women who had not been beaten. So that kind of started me on my path and my passion for understanding both the health impact of domestic violence and sexual violence, and now much more recently, what works to, to prevent violence. Thank you. Um, Nancy, how did you get into this work? I'll turn this on. Okay, so it's really nice to be here. It's nice to be with colleagues again. I haven't seen in person for a, uh, a couple years. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm Nancy Glass. I um, am from far away Baltimore. Um, and uh, and the mothership, and it's so it's so nice to take the train. It was the best thing I've done all week, and it's a beautiful day. I'm in D.C. I'm a very happy person right now. Um, so I um, I came to this work. I um, was trained as a nurse. I'm and uh, was working in emergency departments and uh, started volunteering in a shelter for. Uh, uh, battered women in Baltimore and recognized that I had no training absolutely in my curriculum around violence against women or children and really started to ask questions and um, Jackie Campbell who who's done this work for a long time had just come to Hopkins and I went to see her and she gave me a research assistant position um, I knew nothing but I started to, she was doing a study on femicide, the murder of women by uh, intimate partners, and looking at 11 cities throughout the U.S. And it was one of our first studies in the U.S. really trying to document risk factors for being murdered by an intimate partner. And so for my Ph.D., I did that research in what's called shock trauma at uh, the University of Maryland um, in Baltimore, and started talking to women who had come to the trauma center, um, if it hadn't been for amazing trauma care, they might not have survived. So gunshots, stabbings, other amazingly um, traumatic events that they had survived. But I started talking to them about risk factors for f homicide and, uh, or femicide and started learning that they had no housing, they, they had didn't have much opportunities for job training, and so they were often in situations where they are at risk of being assaulted again. And so I really started thinking, why am I working at a trauma center when things have gotten so bad? Why not really think about public health and how to prevent violence and, and really think about uh, economic empowerment and um, trauma-informed care? And so that's how I sort of moved into more of a public health approach to violence against women. Thank you. And Myra. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I actually started this work back here at my time at SICE in 2002 as an intern at the World Bank. Um, I was sent to Panama and Honduras to document and assess programs that were engaging men in sexual and reproductive health. And the only programs that were even close to that at the time were male batter intervention programs. So I was, I found myself uh, I guess I was 22 at the time, sitting um, in these programs, really listening to these men that were mandated to participate um, by the state in, in these uh, perpetrator programming to try to prevent gender-based violence or intimate partner violence. Um, that internship turned into a one-month consultancy at the World Bank after graduating, which turned into a two-and-a-half-year stint. I'm sure many of you know this story as a SICE, the SICE graduate. Um, and that actually included uh, pilot programs in back in Honduras, Nicaragua, and Bolivia to um, screen and identify um, intimate partner violence in um, the health setting, and that was, uh, Mary actually was involved in that, in early designs of that, and so she was one of my first mentors, so it's very much an honor to be here on a panel with her. Thank you. Um, and so, perhaps let's start by framing our discussion today within the concepts. Uh, Mary, when we say gender-based violence is a public health issue, what, what does that mean? Um, well, I think it's, you know, it starts with uh, the kinds of issues I was saying before. When I started and when I met um, Lori Heisey, who's also a professor at um, Johns Hopkins and who is my mentor in this field, um, 
people thought of violence as mostly around injuries and, and maybe femicide, murder of women. But we're talking about very much, um, you know, physical, the direct physical consequences of violence, right? Of rape, of being beaten. And as we started doing more studies on, like the kinds I mentioned, epidemiological studies, prevalent studies where we're looking at risk factors and impact, we start looking at the impact of violence on, on women's mental health, for example. In Nicaragua, we found that 30%, we did a prevalent study on mental health distress, and found that 30% of the cases were attributable to, um, to intimate partner violence. So it just, once you sort of go down that rabbit hole, you realize that violence is not just, you know, the, the injuries are the tip of the iceberg, and that it's much more useful to think of violence as a risk factor for so many other um, serious health conditions, and, and that it's so common in the population that it really constitutes um, a, a serious public health concern. And I think many of us have spent the last sort of 30 years trying to convince people in WHO, in, you know, in the public health field that this is a serious problem. And part of the way we've done it is by saying, well, if you care about children, you need to care about their mothers. Um, if you care about mental health, you have to worry about relationships. You have to start asking about it. The health system has to start taking this into account as a serious risk factor, for example, for low birth weight. And just getting them to think about it in a new way. Um, and understanding, part of it is just understanding how, how extremely prevalent it is. Thank you. And, and, and Mary, one of the other grounding concepts uh, here is um, health systems approach. What, what does that mean? I think Nancy. Nancy, I'm sorry. Well, I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, so uh, when I think about a, a health system approach, um, I'm thinking about the integration of um, more of a comprehensive approach to uh, health systems where we're integrating care of women and children and identifying uh, impact of violence against women throughout the healthcare system, that it's not just the emergency department responsibility, that we're starting to integrate it into primary care, into prenatal and postpartum care, places that we know women, for example, are seeking care. I think we're also looking now, finally talking about equity and gendered responsive healthcare systems. So when do we offer services for women? When do, you know, how, you know, how do we integrate um, gender responsive care into pediatric services, into nu nutrition? You know, um, the other thing is who are providing the care, supporting healthcare workers, who are 70% of healthcare workers in the world are women, and um, they are often uh, working long hours as healthcare providers and then working long hours at home. Um, and the systems aren't built to support, um, you know, childcare. They're not built to support uh, reasonable shifts and hours. 12 hour shifts are very demanding when you have children. So all of these systems have been built with. Um, without a response to the, the, the needs of the patient and provider, in my opinion. And so I think when we're talking about responsive healthcare systems, it's really taken a step back. And this is what, this is what Mira does a lot, is really looking at working with JAPIGO is around gender, uh, gender responsive systems, health systems. Thank you. Um, and so before, if you have anything to add to that, Myra, um, one of the successes of research, um, activism, and advocacy um, is the highlighting and the naming of the shadow pandemic. Um, if, if at all, how has the COVID-19 changed your perspective about gender-based violence? Um, I, I don't know if it really changed my perspective. I appreciate that the naming of um, GBV as also a shadow pandemic really brought more attention in a way to it as, as a, an issue that, you know, is uh, affecting, you know, even more people and magnitudes of people. Um, but yet we are investing 
um, you know, so, such a minuscule amount compared to other public health issues and diseases, or um, I should say public health issues. Uh, I'd leave it at that. But I, I do think in terms of the, the approaches and responses that um, we've been taking, I have now sort of a greater appreciation, and I think there is more attention and space now for mi risk mitigation, right? So we've talked about prevention, we've talked about, well, response, I started out in response, and then there was, I think, a, a shift more towards, you know, how do we get at the root causes, social norms, and, and broader kind of structural issues that are driving um, gender-based violence. But I think there is also sort of the the in-between of risk mitigation. And in the context of the pandemic, we saw that, you know, at least what people were pointing to as increasing spikes of gender-based violence um, were related to kind of the quarantine or, um, you know, the, the trauma and stress of, of um, really being confined at home and not really knowing how to cope with that situation. And that's where I think some of the, you know, increasing evidence there is now around some of the interventions that address things as such as alcohol prevention, which can, um, uh, has been shown to also mitigate levels of violence, couple relationship skills building, um, which can also, has now been shown to um, mitigate violence, um, coping skills, um, uh, mitigating, you know, mental health uh, issues and concerns, I do think have a place in the broader kind of um, arena of gender-based violence programming as well. Thank you. Um, Nancy, has, would you say that um, the success that you know, we talk about in, in bringing this to the fore, um, has there been any additions to what you know and think and how you, uh, in your work, address uh, gender-based violence in terms of response, uh, prevention, and, and prevention uh, since the uh, pandemic started? I think what's been really interesting is it's, um, you know, the, the pandemic has exacerbated all the inequities that have already existed for years. And, and um, when we start to, you know, we start to see them in our, in our lives more than we, we, had, we, we didn't recognize in the past. They were right in front of our face this time. The essential health workers, I mean, the essential workers, the demand on people who had uh, very little resources and that we were all benefiting from them working. I think it just was much more in our face, but it, it always existed and it exacerbated. So we couldn't, it wasn't as easy to ignore. I think that that was one of the things. And with gender-based violence, I mean, we, we all knew as soon as it started, it was gonna get much worse for women who were in unsafe situations. And, and the thing I have to say about the field, we, we, did, we did do a major change and very rapidly. We had resisted, in my humble opinion, as a field technology, as a way to reach women and to advocate, or women and men and, and children, as a way to provide resources, to provide services, to provide counseling. We had, re we had uh, resisted telehealth as healthcare providers. Systems didn't want to pay for telehealth. Insurers didn't want to pay for telehealth. Everything changed on a dime. And we saw that we could do this safely. We could have meaningful exchanges. Certainly it's not the same as face-to-face. -face. We all know that. But we as a field said, okay, we have to stop resisting this. There is, there is value in staying in contact, even if it's not in a group or face-to-face. -face. So I think that was a big leap and a forced leap. We wouldn't have done it otherwise. Thank you. Um, really interesting. Um, the, the, the facilitation um, through technology. Okay, great. So um, if prior to COVID, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, many organizations and advocates use the word pandemic to uh, describe the persistent levels of gender-based violence globally, um, evoking the sense of it being a disease to be cured. Um, what can GBV prevention and response efforts learn from the global health response efforts more generally, both in terms of their successes and failures? Um, and where does this metaphor or definition fail? Um, Mary, Mary, do you want to start off? Well, yes. Microphone already. This is, um, it, it just is reminding me that my first, um, my first visit to Washington was in 1992. It was an event 
it was um, the Global Health Council, it was called an NCH, NCHI, it was the National Conference on Health something. Everybody was here who <laughs> did public health stuff. And it was, um, it, I'm sorry, I'm making so many mistakes. I hope we're not taping this. Are we taping this? Yes. <laughs> anyway, it was on violence again. It was on violence. And Mark Rosenberg, does that sound right, from CDC? Okay, the guy who did the gun violence stuff? Okay. So the C CDC was a big part of this. And it was on violence, mostly violence against women. And they were all very gung-ho about violence as, as an epidemic. And just like any other epidemic, there will be a silver bullet. There will be a vaccine. We will use the public health approach, which means we you know, understand what the problem is, the prevalence. We look at the risk factors. Then we create an intervention, and then we evaluate it. And just like we eliminated polio, he literally said, just like we eliminated polio, we will eliminate violence against women. And at the time, we were all kind of like, really, is that, you know, is that really a good, <laughs> a good metaphor? And I think it's been problematic in our field that we keep looking for the fix. And donors want to see what is the best buy. And the minute you finally, and what's been hard on our field, I think, is that it took us 20 years for people to recognize that it's actually a public health problem and we should be doing something about it. And then the next day, donors are saying, okay, well, what are the most effective interventions? What should we be doing? Where, we do, where do we put our money? Where's the best buys? And it's like, we have had no funding, no research funded around this. You know, we're, and I think that there was a lot of um, sort of rush to have interventions that were not really ready for prime time, lots of RCTs, a lot of them were not very effective because we were just making stuff up as we went along. And it took a while to finally, like, to finally acknowledge, and I would say it's in the last few years, to acknowledge that there is no, there's never going to be a silver bullet. It's very, it's caused by many, many different factors at a structural level, at an individual level, at a community level. And to reduce it, we have to work on all of those levels. That's never the answer that anybody wants to hear. And um, if, if I can, just a little anecdote, I'm just remembering, um, we had Malala's father, Ziaudin Joseph Sai, come to GW several years ago. And the interviewer to him said, so, it, you know, if there were a magic bullet to, to eliminate violence against girls like Malala, what would it be? And he said, there is no magic bullet. And she said, yeah, but, but if there were, what would it be? there's no magic bullet. She said, I, I don't think you've understood. So a magic bullet is a thing that we do that just fixes things. And he's like, I don't think you're understanding. <laughs> but it was funny because it was just like, she's so persistent and trying to get an answer and there is none that's like that. It's, every, it's all these things together. Anybody else want to add? <laughs> I guess I would say, you know, what can we learn from other public health issues and, and the response to that that we can adopt? That's kind of the summary of the question, right? I, I think I look at my colleagues working in, in other spaces, other pandemics, such as HIV, for example, where, where they mounted a large coordinated response. There's an agency called PEPFAR, some of you might know, that um, coordinates the government's response to that with huge investments and targets. And I feel that if we maybe had something similar that actually set specific targets and had, you know, a large coordinated agency behind it um, really uh, investing in the resources to focus on gender-based violence as a primary health outcome in and of itself, not just as a mitigation as part of other health issues, which is currently mostly the case, um, that perhaps we would see some um, similar strides in terms of prevention. Um, I'm you know, heartened to see now UNAIDS actually has as part of their framework and targets besides just um, 95, 95, 95, which is, you know, getting 95% tested onto treatment and then um, actually adhering to care, but also reduction of levels of violence to 10%. Whether we will see matching investments to try to meet that um, will be amazing. Thank you. Um, and so uh, some have raised concerns about relying on healthcare workers to incorporate uh, gender-based violence prevention and response into their work, arguing that they are already overburdened. Um, how do you weigh the risk of asking too much of um, healthcare workers with the reality that 
uh, they may be the best positioned to respond. Um, Nancy, do you want to take a crack at this? You know, we have this discussion a lot, and um, it is true. We put a lot on the healthcare worker, community health workers, from, you know, from the community to nurses to physicians, and we continue to ask them to do more with less. Um, but my challenge is if one in three of your patients that are coming into your healthcare setting, and we know that they have most likely experienced violence in their life, and we know the significant and profound impact violence has on health from physical, sexual, reproductive, mental health, and we decide as a profession not to ask the question because it will take too much time, that is unethical. In my opinion, we would never do that with diabetes. We would never do that with uh, hypertension. Um, that, saying that, we have to integrate social work. We have to integrate um, counseling. No one wants to pay for these services, although with the Affordable Care Act, it is required, it's still not integrated, to ask the question and provide brief counseling and referrals. That is part of preventive services that should be, you could get paid for if doing. But we continue to say it's too burdensome, it's too much. Um, and I just, I just ask my colleagues, is, is that okay for these other health issues that are coming into the health system? And so I think we need to, um, I think we still need to challenge healthcare providers to make to help them understand that it is a health issue. I still hear pushback that it's not a health issue, believe it or not. I think we have to have it integrated into curriculum. It's not well integrated in curriculum. I've been in Hopkins for over 25 years. Honest to God, they still don't screen in most of the settings. Or when they do screen, they're looking at a computer screen and they're saying, you aren't abused at home, are you? What would you say? No, no, not abused at home. So we're not doing it well even when we integrate it. So it's a willingness to pay for it by the um, health, the insurance system. And um, they, don't, they don't seem to take it seriously how expensive violence is on the health care system as well. So I, I, I just don't buy it as, as an overburdened health care provider. Thank you. Um, Myra, do you want to, what would you say are the limits um, of sh this shift um, towards the, the healthcare, health uh, systems approach? The limits of this shift. I mean, I definitely see the limits in, in the countries that we are working in. Um, I just came back from Nigeria, actually, where we're running a study to do just this kind of integrate screening for intimate partner violence and antenatal care and family planning services. And Did you eat plantain? I did eat plantain. I ate oh, jollof nice. rice. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, many other things we could talk about. Uh, but I, 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 yes, there's, you hear so much about the limits of the re low resources, and, and we see that. Um, but I think at the same time, and I think what Nancy is alluding to is the idea of perhaps making our services much more efficient um, and the overall burden on the health system um, eased on the long term if we we do come to services with trauma informed care, um, which we know you know there is now evidence that um, trauma affects health, um, biological health, not just mental health. Um, and so, I think that with proper training, we are seeing that this can be integrated um, in, in, in maybe, you know, yes, it's going to take uh, some time, extra time to the to the clinic visit, um, but not as much time as, as one would think. And, and I think, you know, in at least from what we keep hearing and seeing is that most women aren't even willing to take action at this point. But that, that at least you know in Nigeria, I'm just coming directly from um, from there in in the settings that we're working in. But that, in fact, might be just the first point of awareness for them. Um, and I think you know what we measure also matters. And um, oftentimes, you know, I think we are in the in the health uh, setting or in public health, trying to look at specific clinical conditions. Um, and uh, what they call high impact health behaviors and measuring those um, and not necessarily uh, giving value to some of these other things such as 
now a woman is aware what violence is and maybe that uh, won't lead to action today, but two years from now, you know, and that's harder to measure. And, and we're definitely working in a space of the tyranny of the tyranny of the countable. Um, and so uh, because you said you're just coming back from Nigeria, I don't know if you've heard um, that one of the most loved gospel singers um, in the country uh, just died from injuries sustained from uh, intimate partner violence. Um, and so for the first time, I think in my adult life, I actually hear men um, talking about the, the um, senselessness of <laughs> domestic violence. Um, and, you know, they show this um, video of men, because she was really loved, um, of men, you know, weeping and boo-hoo-hooing, you know, and I'm wondering, if all the men are crying, who are the perpetrators, right, if, uh, cursing out the man and, and you, you know, uh, you, I mean, it's, the, the social media is a gog, you know, in, in Nigeria, and, um, because typically you hear, you know, well, you don't submit to the man, and that's why you're getting a whooping. And, but that's not what we're hearing. Um, across, it's about, you know, why would you um, hit a woman? And it's about 85% of the narrative going on now. Um, I just thought maybe it's something. And then that also uh, leads us to the next question, um, Mary. Um, as with issues of research, is, uh, with any issue, research and data um, are essential to crafting real solutions. Um, however, there are specific challenges and ethical tensions when conducting research on such a sensitive issue as gender-based violence. How do you balance the need for cultural sensitivity and the safety of respondents with the goals of the project when conducting research. Um, by the way, she died because she needed to align herself with the norms of staying in the marriage because she's from the eastern part of the country, right? Uh, so again, um, signaling the issues of norms and, and sensitivity and, and in, in dealing with these issues. That it's very interesting that you've put together the ethics of safety and cultural sensitivity. And I, I think that the cultural sensitivity issue, also it's, it's who defines what's sensitive, right? So at the beginning when we started talking about going door to door and asking women, you know, the first question was like, how do you even do that? Can you knock on somebody's door and say, does your husband beat you? Um, and we all, and everybody said, that is too sensitive. You can't ask that. People will be offended, especially if you ask about sexual violence. Um, and what we found, you know, by trying it out in different groups, and so going to that piece of it and then to the ethics piece, is that women were actually, as long as it was, it was a safe place where they were not in danger of getting of reprisals, of anybody finding out, an abuser finding out that they talked about it, they were so grateful that somebody asked them about this. So, you know, culturally, it was completely taboo. People did not tell each other about it. Um, I was just recently in a group in Solomon Islands where um, I'd been asking, they'd been asking, they'd been doing mixed groups and asking, uh, does anybody here, does it ever happen where a husband will come home drunk and then he will make his wife have sex with her? We were trying, they were trying to get in at marital rape. And everybody, the men said and the women said, everybody said, oh, no, that would be completely taboo. That never happens. And then I, I was traveling with my husband, and I said, would you mind taking the men over there and doing a separate focus group? So he, he went off, and he asked them whatever <laughs> to keep them busy. And we got the women alone, and I asked the same question. You know, does, have you ever heard of that? Does that ever happen? And they said, that happens all the time. That always happens. He goes off, he gets drunk, he comes home in the middle of the night, he wants to have sex, and if we don't want to have sex with him, he'll beat us. And so then they started all adding on and adding different stories, you know, stories that they had heard of or knew of. And finally, one of the women said to me, do you know, we've never talked about this before. And I said, do you mean to outsiders? And she said, no, none of us have ever 
talked about this to each other. Now, these are, it's a very small village, and they're all age mates, basically. They're women who grew up since they were small children. They know the husbands. They know the entire village. And they had never discussed this. And every single one of them virtually had experienced this incredibly painful thing. So that's where I feel like, you know, the issue of cultural sensitivity is a little bit, you know, who does it serve um, when there are inequities and when there are power imbalances? Um, and who decides what's too sensitive to talk about? That's one piece of it. The other piece of it was that we did find out if you just go in and start asking and there are children around and the demographic health surveys are usually conducted with other people around. Everybody hangs out to hear, you know, what kind of birth control she's using and how many children. And that's considered not very sensitive in, in many countries. Um, and we discovered that if you do that and ask about violence, she's going to get beaten up that night. And we started hearing cases of that and realized that we needed to think about this kind of research in a completely new way. And with the uh, World Health Organization, we actually developed in the early, the early mid-90s a set of guidelines of things that should be done. And they're more or less than the, help, the, the gold standard still for DHS and for any kind of population-based survey, which is basically, there's a whole set of them, but basically the safety of the woman, both the interviewers and the respondent, is paramount. If you can't do things safely, you should not do that study. That's the bottom line. And I've been in cases where, um, particularly in conflict settings where it's even more dangerous, where we've looked at all the possibilities. You need to be able to have referrals if they disclose violence and they need medical or legal or psychosocial counseling. You need to make sure that you can do things in complete, I, uh, in complete privacy, not so easy in a refugee camp, for example, or even in places where huts are very close together. Um, you, there's a whole series of things. And if you can't do them, I have been in several situations where we've said, okay, this is unethical, we, we shouldn't, we can't go ahead. Um, so yes, ethics is, is a part of every research endeavor, but I think it really came home to us how extremely, it, how it can be a matter of life and death, the way we conduct our research. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Uh, right, please. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that was a, a great allegory to, to explain, so I don't know if I have much more to add, but I would just like to thank Mary and her colleagues and others that have developed actual research um, ethical guidelines that we use all the time in, in our studies. Um, and you know, to the, the question of how do we do it in a way that's sensitive, and I, I think you know, with this study in Nigeria, we went through a phase of really adapting, testing, co-creating with the community, the tools and resources, and a two-month pilot before we actually in, uh, enrolled and started the study to make sure that um, we were taking into account those cultural um, sensitivities that we needed to adapt to. I can to. add just one other piece around when you say about how to talk about it. Some of the basic, basic parts of this that are both part of the rigor but also the ethics is to take away any kind of victim blaming language, to never say why did he beat you because that implies that there, he had a good reason for beating you. You might say what are the kinds of activities that would, or, or, or what, what might have led to it or triggered it. Um, we don't, you know, use language about, um, you know, about, we, we also don't talk about violence. We don't ask them has your husband um, been violent with you. We ask about very specific acts of violence that are, you know, standard um, behavior based. So, does he beat? Has he beaten you? Slapped you? Kicked you? Shoved you? Held a knife against you? Um, hit you with something that could hurt you? And again, there's no judgment there. We define violence as any one of those acts, any time. She may or may not consider it violence. A lot of time they'll say, oh, it was just a slap. You know, so we're not telling her that what she's experiencing is something other than what she thinks. We're really just talking about the specific acts. And I think that's also very important for being able to use similar instruments across many different cultures that interpret each of these actions in a different way. Okay, um, and, and so that's really interesting, right? If maybe we could just, stay with that just a little bit. Um, and so when we were looking at what was going on online in the past couple of days, um, we found out that men have stayed away from their usual language. What did you do? 
you deserved it. You don't submit. If you could, if you would only submit, right? So it was just really interesting. Men were not saying that. It was women, right? Where we found that language, it was women, because one of the things that came out uh, was that she had new music, and she had asked somebody to help her record, uh, but to do that without letting the husband know. And so what we were finding uh, was that women were saying maybe that's why he uh, stomped because he stomped on her chest and, and all of that. And so, you know, to connect that to what you're saying, that, that you don't tell the woman, right, that what she's experiencing is violence. That there's a tensile stress there. How do we reconcile those? Well, I think the issue of social norms is something that we are more, you know, increasingly recognize is really core to, um, is a core root cause of, of violence. Of course, behind that is gender inequality at, at writ large. But um, we ask questions in most of our surveys about what women and men believe. Um, do you think a man has a right to beat his wife if she doesn't do one of these things if she doesn't, if she neglects the household, if she goes out without telling him, if she talks back to him, if she, if he suspects she's having another affair. And something, and I learned this actually from Lori Heisey, most people don't say that a man can beat his wife under any circumstances. It, in every culture, there's a series of reasons why she could be beaten and other reasons why she can't. And it has to do usually with transgressing gender norms. And, um, you know, he's not allowed to do it for, uh, for just any reason. But if she does one of these things, um, and that, those are norms that go for men and women. I mean, everybody absorbs them. So I often hear people say either, um, oh, women are so much, much more machista in Latin America. You know, women are as machista as men. Women raise the children. They tell them they also think women should be beaten. Well, yeah. I mean, if everybody says that to you and you're experiencing it and you're being told that it's because of you and what you've done, not just by the husband, but everybody around you, your mother, your priest, everybody, that you, you internalize that and, that and, and it makes sense. So I, I think it's also, if the women are, it's interesting what you're saying, because in this case, the men are not saying it and the women are saying it. Maybe the men are thinking it and feel a little bit like it would not be cool to say it out loud. I doubt if they actually, I don't know what others think, but I doubt if they're actually sort of um, more progressive than the women. Right, right, okay. I also think that, I think especially with the social norms, I mean, we're, what we, We've been doing a lot of research with just what are common norms um, around um, that sustain violence against women and, and girls globally. And some of the things that we hear is that the, the norm of victim blaming, that um, if she hadn't been there, if she hadn't worn this, if she hadn't, um, if she had just told her husband that she was going to record the music, then he wouldn't have had to do that. It, it, we hear, you know, that's very similar for women and men. But also family honor, the the dignity of the family, dis, you know, the family, the the fear of this family's reputation. Um, if she's raped, for example, how would she be less less likely to get married? So protecting that. A husband's right to use violence to discipline is is very. These are very common norms globally. And you, right? You just don't air this. And so, I think also women. I mean, we have this need, as I think, as human beings, to say this couldn't happen to me. She must have done something I wouldn't have done because my husband beats me. But he, I would never do this, so I would never be murdered. I think it's just like somehow to say this couldn't happen to me. False consciousness? I, no? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the right language. You, that might be the right language. But it's that, think that I, my situation's different. It couldn't, ha this, it couldn't become this dangerous for me. And I think that what Mary's talking about oftentimes, when we start talking to women and we ask them about, we ask them, Frequently, uh, we call it a, a dangerousness. How dangerous is the relationship? And we ask them questions like, do you think your partner's capable of killing you? And they start to say, 
yeah, he's put a knife to my, my throat. But it's not, if I said, are you an abused woman? She'd say, no, not at all. So it's, it's, it's it, when someone you're love, who's supposed to love you and that you love them and they're doing these things, you're trying to figure out, you know, who's, who, is it my fault? Uh, absolutely. Can I add one less, less piece? Because I think this is what the health sector can do sometimes. When I've seen, um, particularly in Central America, sort of evaluating programs that uh, encourage um, health providers to, to screen, saying, just saying, you did not deserve this, this isn't your fault, you have rights, this is against the law, those are amazingly um, profound and transformative messages that she's never heard before. And I think sometimes just saying that, you don't deserve this, is, um, can, can change a woman's life. And that's a pretty easy thing to say. So. Thank you. Um, and so, Myra, uh, maybe if, let's move on um, a little bit. Um, while this discussion is uh, framed around GBV as a global health issue, we recognize that a health drive um, approach can only be part of the solution. And what is really required is a breakdown of traditional silos in policy development. Um, in policy and development. Of course, this is easier said than done. Uh, what does working across silos look like to you? What are the greatest challenges? And where have you seen um, success? So I think um, where I've seen it really successful and where the barriers really break down is at the smallest unit of government the local government association, the LGA in Nigeria, or the community, because that's where the rubber hits the road, right? And that's, you know, so I actually um, ran a study in Nepal where we uh, tested or piloted having female community volunteers um, raise awareness in the community and, uh, you know, then identify women who are experiencing violence, refer them to the health service, because it was a, a health program and it was in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, they insisted, you know, they should be referred to the health facilities where we have trained health providers and, um, you know, one-stop centers where we have, you know, trained health providers as well. But the women knew that what was needed was not just a health response. The women didn't Necessary, or the survivors weren't looking for, you know, a treatment of an in immediate or recent injury, but rather many other things, such as uh, social support, um, economic support, you know, someone to help mediate and prevent uh, their daughter being forced off getting married very young. And so, you know, really going down to that level, it, it, it kind of the silos uh, in terms of what's on paper and who's getting funded for what um, tend to you know, that's where it really breaks down more. Yet, un unfortunately, those are the least funded and resourced um, personnel. And, and, you know, the fact that they are community health volunteers is, is um, really quite sad. But I, I think the challenge is, you know, at this higher level, a national level, policy level, um, you do, it, it, it's divided up and people are vying for different, re very limited resources. Um, so, you know, again, I just came back from visiting with the health ministry, uh, the federal ministry of health, but we also are engaging the uh, women's affairs ministry, which tends to kind of get sidelined and, and low resources, yet they are the ones working across sectors. So um, we also really need to engage them as well. Thank you. Uh, Mary, yes. Um, I think an issue that we haven't discuss, discussed here at all really is activism. And definitely I agree with Myra that community-based approaches are, are the ones that have been most successful. Um, and the most successful intervention that we know of is called SASA. It was piloted or started in Uganda, but it is activist-based. It's not just, it's not institutions. Um, and, and that's what, the same for policy. The, there's been research on what countries have the best laws and, the, and what is it that leads to that, and it's the existence of an autonomous women's movement. And that is the major, um, that's the major cause of having good laws and policies. It's not an accident. The, to get uh, violence included as a, as a standalone target in the sustainable development goals, that was the product of 20 years of activism of women's movements. 
And where I've seen this take place on a larger scale is back in Nicaragua, when we went back 20 years later after our first study to see what had changed. And this is a period where the women's movement in Nicaragua was very, very strong. And there were campaigns, um, yearly campaigns on violence. Um, there were, because of the demands of the women's movement, there were government programs, and there were crisis centers, and there were women's police stations. And we found a 70% drop in physical violence over a 20-year period, which is the first time that's been, that's been documented, something like that. And we have done additional analysis, and what we found is that um, we can statistically show a relationship between women who were exposed to, the, to feminist organizing. Either they knew about the laws that were drafted and passed by the women's movement, or they um, had watched one of the campaigns or the TV shows, the edutainment programs that talked about women's rights. Um, they were the ones who had the less, least violence, and they were the ones who, if they were abused, were more likely to look for help. Um, so I think we just have to remember, and, and again, when funding comes into countries, it very rarely goes to the women's movement. It goes to governments who haven't been doing this, who don't have the same kind of commitment. And right now, a lot of my research is based on how social movements have an impact on violence. And we're doing a multi-country study to document how, how vital this work is. Thank you, that's really interesting. And, and, and I, I think you just validated um, Validated, validated work that I've been doing, um, you know, in Nigeria. As you know, Nigeria is one of the countries across Africa with the least uh, women's uh, representation in 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 in, uh, in um, formal institutions. And um, of course, you know, there's been a whole lot of um, hypothesizing around it, right? Uh, why is that? And I've been looking, and and I just have work. I came back. I've been, you know two, three trips on this particular issue. And finally, I'm thinking, oh, uh, I found, I dare say I found, I don't know, um, that the, I think the problem is the absence of um, a, an autonomous women's movement, but one with cross mobilization across, um, with the capacity for issuing credible threats right, to the government or to the political parties, right? And so um, you saying this now, uh, I think, because I've been thinking, um, I'm going to get a whooping if I put this out because this has not been. But this is actually really interesting um, and that the, the absence or presence of an autonomous women's movement uh, is so significant as to explain Right, uh, this. so um, a really interesting. And I think at this juncture, we will um, open this up to audience questions before we continue. And so um, if you have any questions, the panel um, is happy to address those. Um, and any questions at this point? Yes, please. Um, she's getting you the mic. Um, thanks, this was very interesting. Um, I spent a lifetime as well working on gender-based violence. Just a couple of comments. I think when we talk about the health system and the responsive health system, we often um, sort of end, end up talking about the biomedical model, you know, clin clinics, um, primary health care, and what have you. And uh, we, our experience, for example, with the lady health workers in Nepal and Pakistan is very positive because these people get to go to homes. So the, 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 the trust that's established is much more than uh, interfacing with the, with the healthcare system. That's one. The second comment has to do with the uh, social norms and what do you call a social norm. And I agree completely that, you know, sometimes we really need to sort of uh, break the taboo or at least dare the, the, the normal. But sometimes those social norms are so embedded into the thinking of people that nothing would change them. And one of the things that are very close to my heart uh, because of how bad it is, is the female genital mutilation. And we did um, a, a study last year within the World Bank um, theme on gender-based violence. 
And we discovered, and I wrote a blog about it called Vocational Cutting, people who are even immigrants in the United States would ship their daughters back just to get mutilated and bring them back because, you know, it's criminalized in the United States, although it still happens around. So I, I, while I agree that, you know, a, a little bit of pushing back on the social norms is probably required, and this is how people advance, but at the same time, this is so much part of one's identity that it's, it's, it takes actually generations and generations. What do we do about them? I, I'm not sure. I can, I can offer an opinion, but it's just something that we probably should ponder designing all of these programs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Myra, were you going to follow up to that? No, I don't know if it was a question or not. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is really interesting. Um, the issue, the, the fact that social norms, right, uh, like you rightly said, uh, is embedded, um, is, is, you know, that those constitute the correlates of identity, right? Um, and, and, and you just said that you're not so sure of what I would, I would think, I suspect you might have some ideas around how we might start getting to this. Do you want to share? The entire thing about sexual and reproductive health and also freedom from violence um, is embedded around women agency and women um, empowerment. And until we get there, I think we, we may see incremental changes, but at the same time, I mean, we've worked a lot with, with women organizations in Upper Egypt, for example, for the female genital mutilation. And you would work there for years and build trust and, you know, the, and the rates start coming down and then a girl goes out with a boy, and then the next morning, everything you've worked for for years just regresses back because that trust building and that behavioral change is so vulnerable and so fragile that it doesn't really sustain the quest of time or the quest of challenge of, of all of this. So I, I think we need to just keep working on women and girls' empowerment in all these aspects, political, economic, you know, voice and agency and all of these. Until we get there, you know, it, there is going to be all of these difficulties. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, Nancy. I, I, on a daily basis, I go from highs to low about changes, the p potentials of changing norms. And But, you know, so last week we saw a new, su a new Supreme Court justice, Jackson Brown, who said, which really was powerful for me, in one generation we went from a norm of segregation to an African woman on the Supreme Court. Her parents were lived in a segregated, went to segregated schools. So then you, you start saying, okay, norms change. And then at the same time, we're watching states after state abortion do it. so then we the backlash right we're constantly like you said you do this work in 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 upper egypt and with fgm and you you make a movement and then there's backlash um but we do we, we do see movement so we have to keep hanging on to that i and and i agree it's 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 agency it's bringing young girls and boys with us because i think that i mean if we, if we think about you know, my, my nieces and nephews and how they see gender, gender, it's so, I can't even imagine growing up having the opportunity to talk about gender in the way they do. So uh, there's hope, and then there's the, the backlash. So I think it is that continuing pushing, pushing. You're right, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Yes. Hello, and thank you guys so much for sharing your insight this morning. I am curious about the male-centered approach to ending gender-based violence. I've seen a lot of programs of like um, He for She, the UN program, or um, other smaller NGOs that are really focused on educating men um, So as a preventative action before they become perpetrators as to the rights of women and um, facilitating that dialogue. And so I'm curious if you guys um, could give any examples of ways that those 
programs have been effective and also perhaps red flags in those programs. I know it's quite a balance between a, a positive movement that it's not all on women to end this thing, that um, men should be actively taking initiative um, and holding each other accountable, but also still keeping um, women empowered in that and not perhaps taking that to where men are doing this without um, the consultation of women or without listening to the things that women really need. So I'm curious on any experiences or perspectives you can provide on that type of programming. Yeah, I forgot that is me. Um, I spent three years in Tanzania working on a um, prevention program for gender-based violence targeting men. It was also HIV prevention more broadly. Um, and, and I think this kind of links to the last comments about, you know, is can we shift norms? And, and certainly there's a lot of work uh, in, still in trying to understand how we measure norms and and um, and how best to shift norms. But I think that we have seen some uh, at least um, sort of smaller scale programs successful in, in specific communities changing attitudes. And this I think goes back to my, my point about investments where I would like to see that then taken to more scale to be able to start shifting norms. Um, but yeah, there are plenty of programs now that are focusing on um, engaging young men and boys through group education and dialogue, um, through community mobilization, through by, what they call bystander interventions, kind of building skills of, of young men or, or men to um, really speak out um, and where appropriate intervene um, when they see violence um, or uh, you know see someone at risk of experiencing violence. Um, we, we ran mass media campaigns targeting men as well where we were actually able to see some shifts around you know attitudes, willingness to speak out about it. So I do, I like to feel positive. I think um, there was a question uh, that we hadn't gotten to about how do we, how do we sustain ourselves in this work? And I think the only way is really, you know, being an idealist and, and staying positive in, in change being possible. Thank you. Um, more questions? Audience questions? Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the panelists, for sharing with your expertise and for the audience. Uh, for joining us and contributing to our small steps to raise ab awareness about uh, women's issues. So my question is related to uh, the regime type and how it, ha uh, it affects um, women's empowerment. For example, in liberal democracies, I think there is more fl flexibility than in authoritarian regimes. So this is more of a personal questions, a question since that is my interest, since I'm from Central Asia. Um, and considering your expertise working in underrepresented and less developed countries, so do you, uh, what do you think will be more effective approach of building um, um, civil society organizations that work on women's empower empowerment in authoritarian, less developed countries? Uh, Mary, I, yes. Yeah, this is dear to my heart right now because I just told this whole 30-year story about Nicaragua reducing violence by 70% and all these incredible um, achievements, largely from the women's movement. And right now, the government of Nicaragua has, be has become, well, over the last 10 years, increasingly authoritarian. And even though it is supposedly a left-wing government, it, that, that, that doesn't work anymore. It's an authoritarian dictatorship. And during that period, they have dismantled pretty much everything. So what I, I, I was there in my last, the study ended in 2017, and it was just at that moment that the government undid all of the police stations that were around the country and just little by little um, started taking away all of women's opportunities to to a report violence, and then they st and they started saying you had to go to government leaders, uh, sorry, community leaders first with no training, who always sent them home, and then they um, it just got worse and worse. And now women's movements have all been banned, um, and there have been you know all the civil dissent is banned, and many women leaders are in jail, many of them in solitary confinement for the last nine months. So clearly authoritarianism is. Um, is 
bad for women, bad for everybody, but bad for women, which is not to say that democratic regimes necessarily are supporting women's rights, but at least as long as civil society has some possibility of organizing um, and, and raising awareness around women's rights, at least there is there's some kind of hope. I mean, I still have hope. I'm an optimist, too. In Nicaragua, I'm so inspired by the women who willingly went to jail for and are in you know solitary confinement for nine months basically because they believe in women's rights so much. And there are many women like that. And even though right now they're spread all over the world in exile, we all believe that they're, you know, they're going to keep they're going to keep fighting for this, and someday things will be different. And I, I think um, that's what you have to believe to be able to continue doing this work. And I just want to add, I've had the amazing opportunity over the last two months to work with the Afghan Midwifery Association. And um, we've been able to, one of the things that we've been trying to do is advocate with our government to reinvest in the healthcare system, right? You know, when you overnight shut down 80% of funding to the healthcare system, a healthcare system collapses, right? And maternal child health is um, supposedly our primary interest, right? As a as 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 this administration, I'd say. So these midwives are, you know, they, you know, they talk about the one thing they can do is go to work right, and freely, I mean freely, they can go to work, they can leave their homes and go to work as midwives. They're organizing. The midwife and nursing council are organizing. What we need to do is support them financially just to help them get a salary. Because they have 3,000 members around the country. And that's the kind of, you know, they're not seen as a, as a threat in the sense of, um, you know how traditional advocates a activists are seen, but they're doing they're they're activists, and so that's where I want to put effort is to really support these um, these folks who are going to work day by day, helping to to support um, their communities and help them remain activists that they are. Thank you, um, and so we are. Uh um, we have uh, 10 minutes. All right. Um, and so just before uh, you have the opportunity to um, offer our closing thoughts, I was just wondering, um, well, this is where in the U.S. and uh, we know that if, if uh, one wants to get uh, the state's uh, buying right um, into an issue in terms of policy and budget and all that. Uh, the fastest way is to securitize an issue, right? Um, securitize an issue. The the use of sexual violence, rape, uh, as a tool of war, um, has is 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 terrorism, right? Because it's meant to terrorize. A population, a community. Uh, um, why is it so difficult to get the states, UN, to frame the use of uh, rape in war as uh, a terroristic um, act and hence get real um, engagement from states? Why is that? has been huge over the last 20 years, all the security and uh, council resolutions on violence, um, violence against women and rape as a weapon of war. Um, and recently, maybe some of you were at the, the, the UK government has put a lot into this. There was a um, prevention of sexual violence summit about six or seven years ago. They're about to do another one. And um, what I, and, and so I think it's not, it's, what you said is, is you can't get people to do anything about it, but people really love talking about it. And you can definitely, there were like 60% of all the foreign ministers were at that meeting, including ours, and all, almost all men. 
And it was, you know, and they were all talking about, you know, we have to end this, we could end it now. And um, what was really horrible about it to me, what really shocking was that they had survivors' voices, but there were two voices, one at the beginning and one at the end, both men who had been raped in war, which is terrible. But it's a very small percentage of the individuals who are raped in, as a cause of war. And then there were women from the DRC, from Rwanda, from all these countries that have had just you know massive amounts of sexual violence, and they were in the basement. They were not allowed to come up to the del to the floor where all the delegates were, who were almost all men. So, um, and the and the message that I've been that has been revealed in the research we're doing, for example, in South Sudan, is that rape in war is terrible and it's very common. It's about 30% of the women we interviewed in South Sudan had been raped by somebody, not their husband. But 75% of women had been raped and beaten by their husbands. And so talking about, uh, it, to me it kind of pushes a button, talking about rape as a weapon of war, as if that's the kind of violence that we can really all get behind about that being bad. Whereas the sort of regular old beating your wife to death is, is not considered as serious. And I think that's part of the work we really need to do with the Security Council and with all of those who are working on that is to, is to do something about all of it and understand that women don't divide themselves in the part that was raped by the husband, the part that was raped by somebody else. You know, it's a cumulative impact. And who are we to decide which of those is worse or more fatal than another? So that's, that's my little pet thing, but I'll let others. <laughs> Yeah, and I also think, you know, we part of the biggest issue is about 27% of global parliaments and congresses are, are made up are women. So we, we don't have representation and um, globally. And in this country, it's 24% um, of our Congress are women. So when these issues come forward, um, this is the spoils of war. This is, you know, this this I really believe that that's sort of how it is still discussed. Um, we, we're seeing it in Tigray. We're seeing it in um, in Syria. We're seeing it in Ukraine, in Afghanistan. It's it's a global issue. But as Mary says, violence against women is something that we have to. It, it is preventable. I mean, it is if we if we decide as a global community that there would be consequences, meaningful consequences, and that norms change. Um, I just don't think we have the leadership in place to demand that. And when we do move forward, push, we get pushed back as we're watching um, in, in our country right now. I mean, we're, in Tennessee, I'm, I'm working in Ethiopia on prevention of child marriage. In Tennessee, you can now be married if you're less than 14 years of age, legally. How do I have any justification to be traveling and doing that work? That's what I just sometimes just think. We have to have these discussions. We have to have representation. Thank you. Um, and so, um, where is time when you need it, right? Um, and just um, um, you know, closing thoughts, uh, Myra, you were saying something about how do you do this work, you know, like, um, and still remain a sane human being. Um, could you fold into that, uh, just in closing, in uh, 30 seconds, what students who want to do, build a career in this in the future should do? And then, um, and then Nancy and Mary. Yeah, I mean, I guess to answer the first part of the question, a lot of self-care. <laughs> I was at the, the spa this weekend <laughs> after my long trip, but definitely um, a lot of self-care. Um, but uh, in terms of what, you know, what we can do to get, or what you can do if you're interested in um, getting involved in this work, I think, you know, you're in Washington, so you, you definitely um, have access to a lot of circles um, and communities of practice. Um, I think one just since I have so little time, I would definitely join the SVRI listserv, which is um, a global uh, sort of community practice of researchers. Uh, there's jobs 
um, that are posted every week. Uh, the latest research, there's going to be a conference in September, which is also sponsoring. Uh, yes, in Cancun, not a bad place to go. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, check that out. Nancy? Um, I, I think self-care is surrounding yourself by amazing people, women and men, who value what you do um, and, um, and have good sense of humor. Um, and uh, you also can make fun of yourself. Um, I spend a lot of time asking what the hell I'm doing. Um, and then running around in circles. I like to run, but since the pandemic, I know I, I now know my superpower is getting from my house in East Baltimore to the harbor when it all goes bad through every alley in Baltimore. I don't ever have to take a main street. So when the apocalypse comes, I can get out of Baltimore. So that's really what I've learned about myself. I will just um, add a plug for the Global Women's Institute, which is just a few blocks away. And uh, we also have a weekly newsletter that I encourage you to, um, to sign up for. And we have a lot of events. And, um, and then I think, as part of self-care, I will add crafts. <laughs> I brought this to show Nancy, but it just it's coming in handy. Um, I knit and I embroider and I quilt. <laughs> I was just I was just at Nancy's house in Guatemala a few weeks ago, and I bought a bunch of Guatemalan fabric and made a quilt. And now I'm doing cantha embroidery. So. During the day, like when I have a little time, I do the quilting part, and then I do the embroidery while I'm watching This Is Us and Abbott Elementary. And um, this is what keeps me sane, and it just kind of helps me. And I, and I knit, and you can't take your quil quilting to meetings with you or conferences, but you can take your knitting. And um, I, got to, I, I started knitting when I was about in my 40s because I finally realized that I didn't care what anybody else thought before that I would have felt um, awkward doing it. But the more of us who bring our knitting and our crafts and to these meetings, the, the happier and more joyful they'll be and calmer and then the less stigma around it. So I feel, I feel like this is my big contribution to women of the next generation um, by making a fool of myself, but joyfully. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, thank you, Myra and Nancy and Mary. This has been wonderful. And thank you for being so accessible, right? Uh, because like I said, um, it, it's not every day you find women uh, as accomplished as you are uh, being accessible, being available. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that you came. And so uh, just to plug um, and another thing, uh, the will, the um, Global Women's uh, Leadership has a newsletter uh, that goes out. And so please, um, they'd like you to uh, sign on to that. And then they also have a survey out now, a Google survey out now on um, the courses, uh, the kind of courses uh, that you would uh, like to see uh, incorporate uh, gender dynamics within size. Um, once again, uh, thank you so much for coming and stay engaged. Vada. <laughs>